Evening folks, uh, thanks for coming. My name is Raj Desai, I'm the Executive Director here at Thai Silicon Valley. And it's great to see you all here this evening on a uh, wonderful topic that you're going to hear about uh, from a highly accomplished entrepreneur, uh, founder, CEO. Um, I guess, uh, if I may ask, how many of you are members? Majority. And how many of you are coming for the first time to a Thai Silicon Valley event? Quite a few. Thanks for coming and hope you'll come again. Uh, we at Thai are uh, totally volunteer driven. I have a small team that helps us put uh, our events and programs together, but otherwise very much supported by volunteers, our president, our board, uh, our charter members, and many other volunteers support us on an ongoing basis. Our speakers, like uh, our speaker this evening, are all volunteers. Uh, they come at their own time and expense to uh, share their thoughts and uh, ideas with us. So we're very fortunate in 20 years that we've had a great number of speakers featured at our events. Um, TyCon, how many of you have received an email regarding TyCon and our program at TyCon? Wonderful. Hopefully you've all registered. Uh, we have a very exciting program, a great uh, list of roster of speakers from all over the world. And this year, uh, compared to prior years, the main distinction or difference is that we have separated out, um, you know, technology-based uh, sessions uh, from one day to the next. In the past, we used to mix up entrepreneurial, you know, know-hows or know-how-tos uh, mixed up between Friday and Saturday. Uh, this year, all of Friday is deep dive into three specific areas, big data, mobility, and software-defined infrastructure, software-defined networks. So, you know, Friday is really technology. And um, a lot of the companies that are going to showcase, uh, both in the Thai 50 awards, the lightning rod rounds, and um, also the showcase expo hall will be all in those kind of specific areas. We will also have uh, significant participation from rest of the world. About 500 uh, entrepreneurs, uh, from different countries, about 35 countries will be present at TyCon. They see TyCon as a great uh, connecting point to be at, uh, to see what's going on in Silicon Valley. Uh, we have companies from Brussels, from Brazil, to Malaysia, to Hong Kong. Uh, Bangladesh uh, is participating extensively this year. Uh, we are very, very delighted to host them here uh, at our conference, as well as arrange for some side meetings for them. So if you haven't already signed up, do, uh, because uh, it's going to be a very exciting program. Uh, second uh, point to make or announcement to make is I think uh, many of you will have received an email that uh, Thai is uh, looking to host uh, very early stage uh, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, host in the way of uh, providing uh, a seat uh, at, a, at a cubicle. I think you've probably, for those of you who've been at our events in the past, uh, the dinner has now moved to this area from what used to be on the left side of this hall and that is all now fitted out uh, for seating space. So anyone looking to uh, you know, start a company and want the Thai connection, uh, not only we will host you here, uh, internet, uh, dinners, coffee, all that is provided, uh, but also give you some charter member engagement so that we can help you, uh, you know, move to the next stage of perhaps presenting at a Thai angel session or going to the VCs. Some of our VCs, accounting firms, legal practices are going to host uh, or hold uh, office hours here and do clinics. Uh, it'll be all free of charge to those entrepreneurs that are hosted here. So you'll get uh, free legal accounting uh, and, and uh, VC kind of uh, advice uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, that's the power of Thai. We are uh, really delighted to be uh, focusing more on entrepreneurs uh, and uh, uh, as entrepreneurship generally all the how to's and uh, are already available through uh, lots of other uh, uh, avenues. Um, with that I'd like to really introduce your uh, uh, speaker for this evening. Delighted to have um, Rene uh, Lassert here with us. Uh, he has an amazing uh, story and, 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 and an entrepreneurial journey that he'll share with us this evening. Of course, the topic for the evening is how to manage your company's uh, finance and uh, accounting uh, effectively. 
So I'm sure you're all keen to hear that because that certainly is a very important aspect of managing a business, uh, certainly at an early stage uh, when you're doing it all uh, by yourself or with just uh, very limited help. Uh, Rene uh, founded uh, Build.com uh, in 2006. Uh, I think you've probably all uh, uh, heard about the company. Uh, they're, uh, uh, you know, uh, operating in the area of uh, managing your billing to uh, simplifying and consolidating your uh, cash flows and accounting systems in a way that you move away from managing it in spreadsheets, which used to be the uh, old way of doing things. Uh, and he's certainly uh, moving on to uh, uh, mobility, cloud-based systems, uh, so that uh, all of these services are available remotely. Uh, so no doubt, uh, Renee will speak to, to that more. Prior to uh, Build.com, uh, Renee uh, co-founded uh, America's number one online payroll service called uh, PayCycle, which uh, was then acquired by Intuit in uh, 2009. Uh, uh, and, and Rene spent about five years in, into it, building a very uh, uh, you know, large uh, business in the credit card uh, processing and um, uh, payment systems, uh, moving from two employees to about 300, uh, about a 30% a year growth, which is pretty significant. Uh, Rene has a master's in uh, science and industrial engineering, uh, and also a bachelor's of art uh, and quantitative uh, economics from Stanford University. With that, let's welcome Rene to the podium. Thanks very much. Hi, everybody. So um, while this is a presentation about managing your finances and making it more efficient so you can spend more time, I also understand and value the uh, tagline for Thai, which is fostering entrepreneurship. I'm a fourth generation entrepreneur. So my great grandfather had a couple of general stores up in Canada. My grandfather had, was, he was a salesman, and he could pretty much sell anything. So he had businesses from general stores to, you know, trading fish with the Indians up in, uh, you know, the Northwest Territory, to orange groves, to computer electronics, to cars. So he could sell anything. He had lots of businesses. He had seven. My dad had um, about five businesses, all of them in financial services. And so pretty much everything since the late 1950s was all about financial services and technology. And so entrepreneurship you know, runs thick in the blood. It's something that I value, and I think it's a really important part of what our economy does across the world, because it, usually it's the, what my mom likes to say is, if we ever knew how hard it was, we would never do it. But we are entrepreneurs, and we never know how hard it is, so we all say we're going to go do it. So uh, with that, I do want to make this interactive. We'll have Q&A at the end, but don't feel, I mean, feel free to interrupt or raise your hand, and we'll go through the questions as they come up. Uh, the, the agenda is pretty, it's a long agenda, but really the theme that we've been working with recently uh, that customers really identify with is the no check CEO. And if we just step back a little bit, you know, let me just get a show of hands. How many people here pay their bills online through their bank? So how many people don't? I don't see any hands, right? So pretty much everybody does. And yet if we went, I'll ask the same question from a business perspective, how many people use their online banking to be the primary source of how they pay their bills and collect their invoices from a bank. There's four, I think, maybe five. So primarily, you know, the problem is that uh, what I identified when I was running PayCycle, and Raj had talked about this, so the prior company I did was a company called PayCycle, did payroll for small and medium businesses, and having run the bill payment and the credit card business at Intuit, I was aware of the demographics and all the solutions out there that supported small businesses and consumers for managing things online more efficiently. And I got to running my own company and I found that, you know what, none of the tools that I developed, none of the tools I looked at, none of them worked for me. The reason they didn't work for me is because I was very much not in a silo anymore. When as a consumer, and I could ask this question, I mean, at our home, you know, I happen to do the finances, my wife happens to, you know, take care of the cooking at night. I do the dishes, she does the cooking, right? But we have, all have different duties, and the finances is one that kind of gets divided up, and it's a one-person job. In a business, you're collaborating. And the way the collaboration goes is you're collaborating across people, systems, and documents. That was the thing that I learned when I was running my business and trying to do what my dad and grandfather had talked about. So one of the things they talked about was stretching out cash, and we'll get into that, but 
the, the point here is that you see that the no check CEO, the remote control CEO, the manual, the going mobile. My big aha moment was in 2003, probably close to June or July. I'd been running PaySocket for four years, and I found that I was just frustrated. I'd come in every Friday to pay bills and have a stack of checks with invoices attached, and I would go through that stack of bills to pay. I'd have questions. I'd go to look at a contract that would be missing. I go ask the VP of engineering whether we should pay this invoice or not. I asked the VP of marketing why the bill was so high. I'd want to know whether Blue Cross had cashed the check yet that I'd sent them last month or not because the invoice was high. And all this was because the collaboration. And so I couldn't be the remote control CEO. So my my focus was totally on the manual process to make sure things didn't get through that shouldn't get through and making sure that I was you know doing my best to stretch out the payables and pull in the receivables. So we'll talk about what it means to be the NoCheck CEO, what it is to be a remote control CEO. If you're manual, you know, um, you can't go ma you can't go mobile. So uh, you know, right now I'm traveling a lot. And I was actually talking with the VC the other day, and he was just asking. Uh, it's a good, uh, a good friend of mine, a guy named Pete Kai. He started CheckFree, uh, which probably all the folks that raised their hands, probably more than half of you don't know it, but you're probably using CheckFree. You might know, but CheckFree is a bill payment business that got bought by Fives, or one of the largest uh, financial process companies, but they have all the deals with the banks that do the, 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 the bill payment. And he and I were talking, he's like, how's it going? I'm like, you know, things are busy, I'm traveling all the time. And so then I said, you know, it would be very interesting if VCs made investment decisions based on how much the CEO is traveling, because none of us like to travel, right? We all have families, we want to be home. Um, but I couldn't run my business unless I had a mobile app to be able to Look at the invoices and the contracts and the bills and manage all that. So go, you can't, if you're manual, you can't go mobile. The, um, there's some feedback in here from you know, some early adopters. The way I got connected into Thai today was from Ashok, and Ashok is, um, does a lot of things, but one of the things he's doing on the side is he's a part-time CFO, and he's got half a dozen businesses that he's using that in managing their finances for, and Bill.com is the way he does it. So he can be in India, he can be here, he can be anywhere, and he can manage the finances. So that's the mobile part. So then we'll talk about some reasons and how to become a remote control CEO, and then some Q&A. So I think we already kind of went through all the details here. Uh, you can see our office. So if you go to Fry's in Palo Alto, our office is on the street that goes as you go into Fry's. So <laughs> that's the, uh, the picture there. So just to give you some context of what we've accomplished in the last uh, six plus years, we have 175,000 businesses that are in our business payment network. So every one of the customers and every one of the vendors that our customers interact with have an opportunity to get paid electronically or to pay their customer, their vendor electronically. And so all of those companies come in, this part of the network is, this part of the business is the fastest growing part. It grows anywhere from 10 to 15% a month. And people just add in because people want to get paid electronically. I mean, who here likes getting a check and has to walk down to the bank? And you know, the picture thing usually they have a limit on it, and there's all sorts of restraints. And who wants to even be forced to take a picture? I mean, if somebody pays you, it should just go into your bank account. So, 175,000 companies that are getting paid and paying uh, millions of bills. I think last time we looked at the report, it was over eight million documents a year, six million bills a year. Um, and worth billions of dollars. So it's $10 billion being managed by Bill.com and about $6 billion going through our bank accounts where we kind of manage the funds flow between these 175,000 businesses. These are just a bunch of brands that you would recognize. Obviously, uh, with the 175,000 in the network, there's a lot more out there that you wouldn't recognize. Most of our customers are, are uh, much smaller than these brands. So we have 13% of our customers are one employee. Uh, and then around 3% have over 100 million in revenue. So we kind of run the gambit, but this gives you a sense of the types of things we're doing. So the no check CEO is, it's, it's really about what we expect from our consumer life. And this is always, you know, the way things work. People talk about how California leads the nation. Well, consumer leads the industry when it comes to applications. So if you think about our personal lives, people are using Facebook today all the time, whether you like it or not, it's happening in your office, right? And that's the social network that people have. Where's the equivalent for the businesses? How are they interacting? How do they collaborate? And that's what we're focused on, is creating that collaboration for businesses that makes it really natural for them to uh, collaborate and to actually get paid and pay each other and to interact. So the no-check CEO, and there are people that are coming up, and we have a, a bunch of them that are customers, 
that come in and say, you know what, I've never paid, I've never written a check in my life because I just use my online bill payment tool. Why can't I do that in the business world? And they understand the value and the efficiency and the control and the intelligence they get by having an automated solution. So they don't want any paper. For, you know, I, I'm. Um, one of these. I have no filing cabinets in the office. I actually do to throw all the the uh, knickknacks and tchotchkes that we give out at trade shows. I like to keep those right, but but generally, uh, you know, I don't have. We have no paper in the office. Everything is scanned, it's digitized, and then anybody can access it from anywhere, anytime. So there's no filing cabinet. There's no checks in the business, and everything's in the cloud. And when you have this type of paradigm, the flexibility you have to run your business is different. The insights you get to run your business is different, and the ability to really create strategic value from looking at your bills versus just paying your bills is different. And so you end up having a strategic conversation with the people on your team about why should I pay this? If we're paying this much money to this vendor on a regular basis, should we just hire more people? Why not? And that conversation can help you grow your business in a different way. So the remote control CEO, it's this new generation that we just talked about, but they really do value the business insights and they're making decisions on the go. One of my favorite testimonials from an accountant who's a customer, I was asking a bunch of accountants, you know, where's the strangest place you paid a bill? And some people said taxi cabs, airplanes, you know, at a swim meet, at a soccer field. Uh, and this woman said, in a dressing room. So she had a client that needed her to pay attention to it. and. She paid the bill from the dressing room. She was buying some clothes for herself, but she, the client thought she was totally obsessed with her and working with her, and she got the call and she said, sure, I'll take care of it. And you know, 30 seconds later, the bill's paid. Another one was the line at Disneyland. So there's, you know, having this remote control option changed your life. And there's another phrase, and I don't know if, if folks here have heard it, but it's another favorite of mine, and it has some, uh, has some challenges with it, but I like it, it says, um, you know, with the internet, the noose is looser and the leash is longer. So the concept is that if you think about what my dad used to do, if he wanted to work, he had to work at home, right, at the office, right? When he got home at six o'clock at night, he was done working. He could think all he wanted, but he didn't have his people, his assistants. There was no way to interact. Nobody would bother people at night, right? And now, you know, you get home, that leash is longer. I can go home earlier. But that noose is definitely there, right? And I'm going to continue to work. And so I think the opportunity is to leverage technology so that you can work when you want, how you want, but giving you the flexibility to have all of this all the time. And so one of the early demos I did, um, it was at the uh, demo conference, if folks have ever been to that. You have six minutes to demo the product. And so I went up on stage and I had a tool belt around my waist. And attached to the tool belt instead of tools, I had all these pieces of paper that said invoices and bills and just mock invoices. And I said, if I really wanted to carry my filing cabinet around with me, this is what I would look like. You know, none of us want to do that, but we want to have access to that information because you might be meeting with a customer or a vendor and you might want to look at that contract. You might want to look at that invoice or bill that they've sent you. And that information being on your phone so you can look at it as you're driving, whether you should or you shouldn't do that while you're driving, is valuable and it gives you flexibility. So this is part of what it means to be the remote control CEO. When we look at the, the, the manual aspect and what that means for how you manage your business, it means that you're restricted to your desk, right? So I'm gonna, I, you'll find with me, I tend to have lots of stories. So one of my favorite songs as a kid was uh, Harry Chapman's uh, Cats in the Gradle. And that's actually still one of my favorite songs. It's a beautiful song. It's kind of sad, you know, the words are basically, uh, goes through the life cycle of a father and son relationship. And in the early days, the son's saying, Dad, come out and play ball with me. And the dad's like, I can't, I gotta work, son. And then eventually the kid goes to college and the dad's retired and the kid comes home and is like, Dad, can I have the car keys, please? It's like, well, don't you want to sit down and talk? No, give me the car keys, please, Dad. And you know, the whole, it goes through the whole life cycle and it's actually kind of hard to think about that you don't have that ability to connect as much with your, your team and your people and your employees when you're manual. Right, because he was stuck. His dad was stuck in the office. I have not. I mean, I've missed a few things with the kids, but you know, out of the hundreds of swimming meets that my kids have had, I've probably been to 95. Doesn't mean I don't work. I bring my laptop and I work. But when they're up for 30 seconds or 45 seconds, I'm there and I'm the loudest parent yelling. And that's the the ability, the advantage of mobile. So as we 
do more stuff like that personally. You know, if you think about, you know, if you want to get dinner tonight, you go on Open Table on your phone, you find a reservation and you make it, or you go to Yelp and you figure it out, or you, you know, you check in a Foursquare and find out where your buddies are. I mean, all this mobile expectation changes how we think, and yet, this is actually an opportunity for, I think, in general for business, and yet the business applications haven't caught up. Everything we do on a consumer basis is driven toward, you know, towards the internet. But businesses are still lagging. And if you, it, I, I mean, it's just a, these are lots of examples. I didn't put up a slide here of examples on the business side. Obviously, email is an important part of everybody's business life, and that is all mobile. But, you know, I'm here to talk about paying bills and managing the finances. What about collaborating on a working document? How can you do that? You know, you still want to sit down at your laptop probably and have all your documents. Well, Google Docs can help, so, you know, but the expectation is, is growing, and I think this is an, a growing area for opportunities for, for folks to invent in because uh, businesses lag. So this is an example of how I felt when I was running PayCycle. I was juggling, right? That's what this, this image is meant to be, is I was juggling a lot of things, and there was, I don't think the picture's in here, I thought it might be, but there's a, I have a picture of my dad and grandfather circa 1972 at a dinner. And the reason I bring that up is, since I was a you know, fourth generation entrepreneur, a lot of times the dinner conversations turn towards the business. And I can distinctly remember one weekend Saturday night in you know, 1979 when I was 12 years old and my brother and my cousins wanted to go outside. We lived in Florida and it was about this time of year. And by this time of year, the oranges have actually started to go rotten. So you gotta pick them a little bit earlier. And they wanted to throw rotten oranges at each other. It's like, that did not sound fun to me. You, you stink later and it hurts. So I stayed in and listened to dad and granddad. And really what they talked about was cash is king. You gotta stretch out the payables and pull in the receivables. And that's a phrase that we probably all have heard. But what tools do you use to do that? Every entrepreneur I talk to is using their own tools to figure this out. And so this is what I was doing. I was juggling. I was trying to do what my dad and granddad had always said, which is to stretch out those payables, pull in those receivables. So I was juggling, you know, did so-and-so improve it? Did I get the invoice? Does this match the contract? You know, when's the last time they paid me? When's the last time I paid them? Did they cash the check? Why hadn't they cashed the check? I mean, you know, all these questions are ones that you're trying to ask. And in a manual process, you're stuck back at the office to do that. And as much as you travel, as much as I travel, it became a burden and it became something I dreaded. So I started thinking about the solution. But before I could get the solution, I started thinking about how is this different than what I did at Intuit? What's, you know, what were we doing at Intuit? We were helping people manage their transactions, report on their transactions. And so you know, the way I look at this, and this, was, this image came up because uh, if folks remember this in the last six months, it was the Titanic's 100th anniversary of being sunk right, by an iceberg. And so I started thinking about the iceberg metaphor, and somebody had said in something I read that, you know, what sunk the Titanic wasn't the tip of the iceberg, it was everything below the waterline. Everything, and that was twice as big as the tip. And so you think about all the things that we've done today with technology to help businesses manage their business, and it's all at the tip. Your banking systems, your accounting systems, they can tell you who you paid, what you paid, and how much on the date you paid it, right? It's very limited. That what they can they can tell you about everything that I talk about is about the process that you have in the back office to make a decision about that payment or that collection, and these are all the things that we look at. And the, below the waterline is a bigger process and a bigger burden that hasn't been addressed. And so that's how we focus on managing and helping you be more efficient with your finances. So in the end, the cloud technology companies like Bill.com they can really help you automate the payments process, where you can get all of your document management done. So, you know, for, for us, if it's a static document, it goes into bill.com. I mean, you know, dead static documents, not being changed anymore, it goes into bill.com. It's just the way we store it. It's associated with the customer or vendor, and this is another big aha moment. If you think about the static documents you have in your business, how many, what percentage of them are dedicated towards a customer or a vendor? Think of an employee as a vendor. Pretty much all of them, right? All of them are static. They're dead. They're documents that you want to keep from a legal perspective. You want to have them associated with the transaction so you can go back later and verify what's going on with that transaction. So we help you with document management. We help you get paid faster. Our customers on average say they get paid two to three times faster. 
We help you with the cash flow management. This is the reference that Raj made to the spreadsheets. Every entrepreneur I've talked to, they pretty much use spreadsheets to kind of track their finances to figure out what bills to pay and what not to pay. And we give you a tool that combines all that and lets you forecast pretty easily. We help you pay the bills, which is uh, kind of the how we started, uh, though the original vision has been all of it. But we couldn't do all of this unless we did the last thing, which is syncing with the accounting software. If we go back to this prior diagram, you have to integrate with the tip of the iceberg. You have to, right? And that's where all the transactions, that's where all the reporting is done today. And so our focus has been on how do we integrate with banks uniquely? How do we integrate with general ledger packages in a unique and special way? And that's where our focus has been so that you can do all this stuff and then all of it just appears in your banking system or your accounting system. So we help customers go from managing minutia to gaining insight. And so this is a diagram, and we've talked to a lot of customers to see that this is a recurring theme, that with the paper that you have, there's just paper flying all over the place and you're running at full speed. All of us are running at full speed for entrepreneurs. And you miss the stop signs, you go over rocks and you trip and you fall and you know you miss a bill here or there, a vendor gets upset, a customer doesn't pay you. You know There are receivables that you write off that you should never write off. We have a customer uh, in Silicon Valley that before they started using us, they had, uh, it's a school, they had over 300 parents or a part of the school. Of the 300, 25%, so 75 vendors, customers, I should say, uh, were past due. 75 parents hadn't paid the bill for their kids. And their process, so we, you know, we started talking to them and they're like, what's your process? Well, we print out the invoice from QuickBooks, we hand it to the teacher, the teacher then sticks it in the backpack of the kid, kid goes home, Parents don't notice that until something starts smelling in that backpack, right? You know? And so when something smells, you take it out and you say, oh my God, there's an invoice. So then they write a check, they stick it back in the backpack. Teacher, eventually the kid remembers to tell the teacher there's something in the backpack. They give it to them. Anyways, that takes a long time. So they went with Bill.com in an automated fashion where emails went out to all of the customer, all the customers. And within five days, it went from 75 parents being passed due down to 12. And so those were the parents that were their real problems. They, you know, parents had lost their jobs or whatever. And so now they could work with them on payment plans. And so I think that's the really important thing to think about is that it, you can't get into gaining insight. Like that. here's 75 families. How do you know which ones really can't pay you? You don't. Let's get rid of all of it by making it really easy to pay. So those people pay you. And now you've got 12 to 15 families that are having an issue. So now we can focus on them. Should they be out of school or should, you know, is there a way that we put them on a payment plan? So that's what we mean by gaining insight. Once you automate, you also get this benefit of being able to go mobile. The, uh, when I started PayCycle, it was interesting because at that point, you know, I actually stepped back. When I was working at Intuit in 1994, the big thing on the internet, I think Netscape had just launched, the big thing was being able to watch, and I don't think I realized this, I thought this was very funny. The big thing was watching some professor at Cambridge University pour himself coffee every morning. Does anybody remember that little webcam that was set up? Everybody was talking about in the valley, and it was just, this guy would come out every morning, you know, 9.30 or whatever it was, and he'd pour himself coffee, it must have been 6 o'clock at night there or whatever, and then he'd go away. And you would just, people, engineers would sit and watch, because they were just amazed, right? They actually got a better night. They were amazed that we were bringing our community closer. So originally, I think people thought of the internet as being anytime, anywhere, which is, is a big part of it. But I think what we've learned in the last 10 years is that the cloud is much more about, much more than that. It's about collaborating with people anytime, anywhere. And the word collaboration is such an integral part of how we view and manage our relationships on the internet. But it wasn't what we were doing, you know, a dozen years ago. When I started PayCycle, what we were doing was saying, Come to our website, put in some hours for the employees, we'll create a paycheck, go away. Well, there's ways to collaborate with some employees that we don't have, and Intuit bought the product and they still haven't built it. But an example would be, you know, how about when you move as an employee, you get to change your address? That might sure be nice and easy, right? Instead of having all those forms go through and the W-2 come out wrong. How about when you have a kid, you can change your W-2 just right on that website, right? Or change your withholding status. And so all those things, are more about collaboration that, haven't, that weren't in the first decade of the internet. And I think that's what we're talking about. So being able to automate means you go mobile, but if you can't collaborate, I think that you're missing a real opportunity. So some feedback from some early adopters. We did a survey um, out to uh, a bunch of finance cloud early adopters asking them, 
you know, how they were you know, valuing the internet and how they're looking at the cloud and what it's doing for them. So, you know, the 510 respondents from this January survey really talked about the ability to be mobile, uh, the ability to keep the business moving forward, and the ability to become more efficient, saving time and more competitive. Our customers tell us that on average, they say 50 to 75% of the time it takes to manage the back office. So I did a webinar this morning with a guy from Burger King. It's, uh, you know, definite entrepreneur. He started with one Burger King. He now has 25, to so $30 million business. Franchising is a very interesting business. I'm sure for some of the folks here, you probably have time members that are franchisees. $30 million business, 800 employees selling burgers, right? He didn't invent the product. He just does it more efficiently than anybody else. And you know, so that's that's what people are expecting. If you can help me save time, and we you know help them save fifty to seventy-five percent of the time. So what these leaders said was that sixty-six percent of these leaders are using mobile devices to manage their financial transactions. So people are starting to do this, right? And so if you're not, then you kind of have to ask yourself why not. And the tech forward finance folks are these are the things they're doing. They're paying bills. They're approving bills. They're managing cash. They're looking at documents. And the things that they're most engaged on would be, you know, paying the bill. And I can't tell you how many times, you know, I would be an example of one of these guys, that I've been able to get bills paid, you know, it, what process used to take me two hours um, on a Friday before I had this technology, now it takes me 15 minutes on a Wednesday night and it's done. Checks are in the mail and I don't have to worry about it. And a complete audit trail, we'll get to that later. So 44% of the respondents said that mobile transactions were a business requirement. So if it's not yet something that you're doing, it's something that you are going to be doing. And I think it's an important part to think about. So uh, the early adopters have gone all in. So 30% of these users, mobile users are doing more than 25% of their transactions on a mobile device. So if you go back to the beginning when I was talking about the complexity that businesses have, which is collaboration-based, you couldn't do that without a new tool. Think about the online bill payment that you're doing at your bank. You get to go in, you get to create a vendor payment, put an amount in, and you're done. Where's the document? Where's the contract? You know, when I make a decision to pay somebody, sometimes I might want to look at the contract they sent me a year ago at this time. I don't know why, I can't tell you why, but I don't know what the reason's gonna be, but I might want that context available. And so being able to do that from a mobile phone is pretty cool, 30% are doing that. 11% are doing more than 50% of their transactions on the mobile device. So one of the advantages that we've also heard from customers is that by making this so universal, we're a company, as an example, we're a company of about 80 plus employees. We have over 30 people that have access to Bill.com to approve and be involved in the workflow. We have two people that have access to QuickBooks Online. I'm one of them. And the controller tells me to get out every time I get in, right? And so the advantage is that you can have this type of context and, and ability to really share and collaborate with your employees and your customers um, in a more meaningful way. And if you can do it from a mobile device, you're going to be able to do more important things. So the top reason is to be a no-check CEO. The first one is to never feel chained to the desk. The, the CEO that can stay in control of the finances outside of the office is one that's more effective. So I, I don't know if folks here are heard of it, there's a group called Vistage, 17,000 CEOs around the world, and one of the things that Vistage talks about is when you're the CEO, when you're running a company, you need to do what you need to do to be happy and successful. And it's probably true for everybody, but oftentimes when you're running a company, you think, oh, I've got my board, I've got my employees, I've got to do all these different things to make everybody else happy. Well, if watching my kids swim for 30 seconds on a Friday afternoon makes me happy, I need to go do it, but I can't strand the business. And so that's what this is the ability, is that I can stay in control. The payment approvals are, are not based on when people are in the office. So one of my frustrations at PayCycle is you would, I would want to have three people approve a bill, but somebody would be out of the office who would sit on their desk for a week. Then somebody would sign it or you know approve it, and then they would put it on somebody else's desk, but then new paper would come on top, and then it would sit there for another week. And so there would be bills that would get paid late because it was lost in the workflow. And you don't want to be chained to a desk. You don't want to, have to be worried about that type of risk um, of loss and, and without, you know, when you don't have to. So the virtual workforce is pretty positive and makes a big difference. So on the relying on financial transactions via the mobile network, I mean, 70% of these executives that we talked to 
said that you know they felt mobile was reliable. To me, it's amazing that 30% said it wasn't reliable. Um, but 70% are saying it's reliable, and it's a way that they're thinking about it. So I think the ability to process transactions and just kind of run your business is something that we're going to see more and more from a mobile perspective. 83% uh, felt it was secure. So this is one of those, security is one of those interesting things because every time you write a check, everybody who sees that check has access to all your bank information. I had credit card fraud last week because I was traveling a bunch and somebody had used my credit card, an Amex card. I got a call three days later and Sears said I was buying a vacuum cleaner from them. No, I wasn't, right? So it's just the same thing with the check. Every, you know, credit, you know, the, the thing about credit cards is that there is this $50 limit and they're very good about catching the fraud. When check fraud happens to you, you're not gonna find it until probably it's a bigger amount and then you're gonna have to argue with your bank and it's gonna be kind of a pain in the butt. Um, so security is an important part. So people talk about is the mobile environment secure enough? I would say that your existing environment is not secure. So, and you know, I think another example of this is, is how do you do, you, I've gone into accountants' offices before, many accountants where I say, where's the check stock for all the clients that you work with? And they just open a drawer, unlocked. All the check stock is there. That's not secure. Everybody can have access to that account information. That's not so great. So scrambling for information. <clears throat> this is a benefit of being you know, a no-check CEO. You get all the information at your fingertips. You don't have to wait. You can see the approvals. You have no lost bills. There's no searching through filing cabinets. No stacks of paperwork. And I don't know how you guys do in filing, but with all the degrees I have, nobody ever taught me how to file. It's, it's, not, you know, it's not a natural thing. And, and yet, when I use bill.com or any of the other applications, being able to just attach it to the vendor and customer means I can find it later. One example of this, which I think is important, and I'm not sure it's in here later, so I'm going to make the point, is disaster recovery. None of us want to think that that's going to happen, but it does happen. So a good friend of mine is a jeweler in Palo Alto, Georgie Glime, if you've seen the Glime stores at Stanford, um, and she, you know, I think a third generation uh, owner of the store, and they've got jewelry and they probably have diamonds and assets, whatever, that they've had for many, many years. Well. If you remember, they used to have a store on University Avenue, and they were next to the Walgreens, and guess what? The Walgreens burned down one night. So she didn't even have the fire in her store, but guess what? To put out a fire that's burning in a, depart, a you know, drug store, took over a million gallons of water. Where does water go? It flows down. Gravity pulls it down. Where does she keep all her records? In her basement. Does she lose all her records of everything she'd ever bought? Yes. So recreating all that is kind of a pain. You don't want to have to deal with that. And so that's an example of not scrambling for information. It's an opportunity to kind of make things better. So getting paid faster, I talked about this, the uh, analogy I gave with the school that was local. But in general, customers tell us that they do get paid two to three times faster. And that's because we automate a lot of the collections process. And we automate the ability for your customers to pay you electronically. We also send notices out to your customers and to your vendors. Uh, for the vendors, we tell them they've been paid, money's in their account in what, X days. Uh, for the customers, it's you have a template that you can set up to say, you know, when they're five days late, say this. When they're 10 days late, say this. When they're 20 days late, say this. And you can change those parameters all, all you want. But that type of, of reminding and constant interaction that you get from a cloud-based application is unique because in a cloud-based application, you get a centralized database that we can write all these types of procedures against to help you run your business more efficiently. So collaboration is an important part. I've men mentioned this uh, already a couple of times, but I can't, you know, I can't stress this enough. My ability to be able to look at an invoice and collaborate with the people that have touched it before and have them say yes or no, or have my customers say yes or no on a question I have, and then have an audit trail of it is really important. One of the things, I haven't, I did hear a study about this, but I haven't actually had a chance to dig it up and read it. But as we do more and more, and we rely on these devices, technology, to do more and more for us, our brains are remembering less and less. Think about the context of what you have to do every day. I, you know, my dad probably wrote five or 10 letter memos a day. I get 300 emails a day and write over 120. Right, so how do you keep track of all that stuff, and so you need better ways of collaborating on that, and you need an audit trail to kind of tell you what happened when and where. And so that's a big part of the technology is giving you that audit trail. Seven, 
the point would be kind of the mobile financial management, which I think we have talked about, but it is expected and you don't really want to be stuck with the paper and the filing cabinet system. You want to get ahead of your competitors. You want to really understand your business and focus on how to grow your business and not how to protect it. And I think that's one of the challenges that, that I've seen out there is that um, I got into business to work and develop financial solutions for businesses. Pretty much nobody else does. No matter what you're doing, you're not getting into business to enjoy the back office. I do. I enjoy the back office. That's why I kind of started the whole thing. But you're not getting into business to start and run payables or run your receivables. You're getting in to do what you love and be passionate about. And so you want to take that and hand it off. And it, it, it hasn't been possible until the, the cloud existed. So the fraud protection, I talked a little bit about this, but there's a product out there, and if you're not familiar with it, um, it's worth researching, it's expensive, but if you're not using Bill.com, you should do it. It's called Positive Pay. Positive Pay is something that any of the banks can offer you. You upload a file from your, your QuickBooks or your accounting software, whatever it is, and the file says, this is who I paid, how much I paid them, and the date I paid them, and the check number. So kind of four fields that you have out there. And then any payment request that comes in off of any check is matched against that file. So the, the risk that we all don't like to think about, because in, generally it is amazing. You drive down the road, people don't run into you. You write checks, people don't steal from you, but they can, right? So the first example of check fraud for me that I experienced was at PayCycle. We had created a payment for an employee who worked at a company, a car dealership in, in uh, North Carolina. She got paid by check, she got fired, Two months later, she used the checking information on her last pay stub to create an account with PayCycle and to move money before we had certain fraud prevention. And, and so, but that can happen any time. I can go into Fry's Electronics and buy check printing software, and if you gave me a check today for joining the membership, I could steal all the money out of your account, and then you would have to fight it with your bank to get it back. And so having this positive pay means that no check ever gets cashed without you having told the bank those four fields I mentioned. If you use bill.com, we embed that into the product and actually it's a little bit better than that because nobody ever knows your checking account. So at bill.com right now, you know, we write lots, lots and lots of checks. The only person that knows the checking account is myself and the controller because he reconciles the statements. But no vendor, no customer, nobody else has ever seen our checking account number. So it's just something to think about because if you want to reduce the risk and eliminate that opportunity for fraud, and guess what? One out of three of us are going to experience fraud in our business career. And it might be $2,000, and it might be $30,000, and it might be half a million. But when it happens, it's a problem you don't want to have. And if you can put something in place today so you don't have to worry about it, then it's good to put it in place today. So preventing errors is an important part. Um, the uh, the the amount of errors from just you know transcribing and all sorts of things really makes uh, for a mess because if you don't mail the invoice payment to the right place, if your customer you know doesn't get the bill because you had the wrong address, all this stuff is important. So one of the things that we can do for you is that we can do all the data entry keying and we do it. It's a double blind data entry where we have two different folks entering the information on the bill so that they do go to the right place. Uh, and then all that gets routed electronically. You have approval flows for you know certain dollar amounts, certain invoices that you can kind of have, and it creates the guarantee of uh, completeness and accuracy. So this is an important part. You know, you want to think about if you can move everything to the cloud, you will reduce the errors. You will obviously get mobile. You'll get more efficient. But these are all things. This is why, on average, and this is going to sound outrageous, but on average, it costs over thirty-five dollars for the average business to process a bill and over $22 for the average business to process an invoice they're sending out. And it's not big, the, when there's no exceptions, it just happens. I mean, it doesn't cost you more than a couple bucks. But when there's an exception, there's all sorts of problems. And the exception is really what we're trying to drive out and try to eliminate. So that's how we help you prevent errors. And then the 10th the point is, um, and our customer sell us this, I'm a little bit you know, I don't like saying this, but it's what the marketing team puts together. Is they tell us that they, we make them look like rock stars. And they look like rock stars to both their customers and to their vendors. Vendors getting paid electronically, it's, they love it. 
right? I, I had to do a little remodel on the house and all of the contractors that I worked with later were like, can we get all of our other, it's like, sure, go for it. Can we get all of our next jobs to do this? Because nobody likes dealing with a check they can't clear, right? You can write somebody a check for more than a certain amount, doesn't clear. <coughs> nobody likes waiting for the mail and as we learned recently, the Saturday delivery is gonna go away and you else, you know, who knows what else is gonna go away. But if you can look like a rock star and look more professional to your vendors and your customers, that elevates your image and that helps. And so that's one of the reasons we have it on here because our customers kept telling us that we made them look this good. Uh, so how do you become? Uh, so one of the things we do is we really help you get rid of all the paper and all the, the uh, filing that you have to do. So we give you an email account at bill.com, we give you a fax number at bill.com, and you of course can just uh, take a picture of any invoice that you have, anything, any paper that comes in. So your customers and your vendors will, uh, you can give them direct access to that so they can email the bills into you that way. Once it's in, we do route all the bills. I was talking with somebody today that said it took them 20 minutes to get up and going. They integrated with their QuickBooks file. They had all their vendors and customers imported. They had all the chartered accounts. They got home on a Friday night after then they'd done that. At home, there was a bill that he wanted to get reimbursed for. He took a picture with his phone and 30 seconds later approved it. Money was gonna move the next time the money moved, which would have been, since it was a Friday night, it would have been Monday morning. Um, so having this ability you know, to have all your paper digitized and scanned and then routed and being able to pay from anywhere and simplifying that whole process <clears throat> really does simplify what you do. And ultimately it comes together in how you manage the cash and forecasting your cash because you can't make a decision, I can't make a decision without about <coughs> who to pay without knowing who's going to pay me and what my expected receivables are going to be. And so when I'm looking at those receivables, I might want to send a reminder, I might want to look at the invoice and look at the history of that customer and see how often do they pay on time, how often do they pay late, that type of stuff. So we give you the ability to kind of command and control the cash flow. It's really getting precision control over the cash, raking in the receivables, which we talked about, and limiting the hassles of paying your bills. We integrate with these accounting packages and more. I think actually zero is missing up here. So we do QuickBooks, QuickBooks Online, Sage Peachtree, which changed its name to Sage 50. Uh, intact, NetSuite, Xero, um, we have Great Plains adapters, Thompson Reuters, all sorts of different accounting packages that are full integrations, but they do integrate. Um, and we sync all the invoices, the payments, and all that with a single check, and we integrate all the customers and charter accounts, and so you can kind of manage that interaction with the accounting software, and more importantly, your accountant can actually manage that interaction, and you can stay out of the accounting software. So what does it mean to be the business cloud payments? Uh, this is just a visual depiction of what it is that we do. We kind of do, um, we do receivables, we do accounts payable, we send bills in from the vendors into bill.com, we then send payments out to the vendors via bill.com, we connect with your bank, we connect with your accounting software, we uh, send invoices out to your customers and they can send money into you. So there's, there's an interesting opportunity for <coughs> folks to create a network effect uh, just using the platform that we have. That's 175,000 entities that are paying and getting paid via bill.com today. So this is, uh, you know, again, this is probably more of a marketing slide, but we do democratize business services. So when you think about enterprise, you know, many of you work with probably large companies that are getting paid electronically, they have certain systems they demand. You know, maybe Ariba is one of those uh, as an example, maybe OB10, whatever. Those systems don't really work well for small and medium businesses. They don't give you the tools, they cost too much money, and so we're kind of democratizing those services and in the conversations we've had with folks, it is a lot more functionality than what they normally get. So that's a big part of what we get jazzed about is helping you get things done more efficiently. So I think the last slide before the Q&A is just, this is, uh, I think this is the last one, um, a testimonial from one of the customers and you know, so he liked paying his bills on a Stairmaster at 7.30 in the morning. And he was able to save 15, 20 minutes, get in the office and feel prepared and understanding what was going on. So there's, you know, he says saves him 100 hours per month, $1,500 per month. The guy today in the webinar said it saved him $100,000 a year. So the point is efficiency and productivity is a big part of what technology is supposed to do for you. And if you haven't, if your back office is full of paper and it's full of filing cabinets and it's full of checks and people signing stuff, 
then there's a lot of productivity gains for you and your business, and that's something to think about. I think that's it. So I don't know how we're doing on time. Yeah, we've got about 25 minutes or so for Q&A, &A. and I'm happy to either talk about managing the finances or about being an entrepreneur and love to engage and get your insights on being entrepreneurs as well. Thank you. Wonderful. No, I think that's uh, really quite interesting to uh, see the details of how Bill.com works and uh, the client solutions that they provide. A uh, couple of questions uh, to really kick this Q&A session off. One is, uh, how does uh, Bill.com sit with the regulatory? I mean, you're not a bank, right. but you handle cash. Right. So how does the cu customer, the client, feel comfortable that the cash is secured, you know, insured, it's not going to disappear in Bill.com somewhere? Right, now that's a great question. Uh, is, do I need to hold up high, or is it good down here? Is it, can everybody hear me okay down here? Yeah. Great. So it's a great question. I, I was amazed the first time at PayCycle that we had a customer, it would have been about 2002, maybe 2001, we had our first ability to do direct deposit. And we turned it on, and I had a bunch of friends that were already using the product, but the first person that signed up was somebody in North Carolina or some other place, I mentioned North Carolina earlier, but some other city I didn't know. It was amazing that they gave me their bank account, right? So, to me, it's amazing how trusting we all are. That was my point about we drive down the road and we trust somebody's not going to drive into us, right? And generally, they don't. Right? And so, I think um, for us, what we do to kind of really help that security, help folks understand it, we do a SAS 70 audit, which is now called a SOC 1 or SOC 2. So we do a SOC 1 type 2 audit, um, which is all about the systems that we have in place to maintain security around the application. We also, uh, different than PayCycle, all the money is in a trust account. Uh, so it's not, I mean, we are, we have access to it to actually make the payments, but it is each of the customers have an account with the bank that we do uh, fund management with. And so the customers have protection because, for example, if we were going to go under FDIC insurance carries all the way down to them. Um, but I think the main thing is that now, I, you know, we're fortunate. When I, I brought up the pay cycle example because <coughs> when nobody had heard of me, I had a really hard time imagining why anybody would trust me, which is great that they did. But now if you look at the track record, you look at the website, you can see that the management team has folks that, you know, we sold a company to, to they were early engineers at Salesforce, they, you know, helped to really get started and whatever. So there's enough people there that I think people can trust um, that we're not, and I've gone with it, so then it really gets down to what's the process of procedures we have in place to make sure it is secure. Wonderful. So follow-up uh, question to that. Uh, uh, one of the things that I rely on, um, which which you know hasn't been replaced with a you know online system, which is to actually you know have the physical check, uh, the check of the service has been received or the right. goods have been delivered, and there is documentation supporting that. And then there is a sign off for the bill to be paid. Right. Uh, that's kind of outside the system. So right. how does Bill.com satisfy that requirement? <clears throat> so that's a great question. That was exactly the process I was using when I was running PayCycle. I wanted to get something that was digital that would help me with that and actually extend all the services um, that banks offer that were kind of too complicated to use. So I wouldn't say that I'm a finance geek. I mean, I like finances. I've had probably a dozen different banking relationships over the last 12 years, depending on debt loans and all that type of stuff. So I've used all the treasury management products that the banks have, and they don't really help, right? And so it was always back to the manual paper process. And so what we do is the we have an audit trail that tells you who approved each bill, when, you know, what time, and who it was. And then when we, you know, if we have to cut a check, and so we're able to take our customers. Um, to 100% electronic payments that they want. So on average, and we're growing very fast, 40% of our payments last month were made electronically. So existing customers are probably closer to 75% of them electronically. But if a check does go out the door, one of the benefits of the services we use is all of that information is, is uh, tagged, so to speak, so that if you wanted to cancel a payment, you can just go to the website and hit void. You can really do that if you're a QuickBooks. So you want to avoid a payment in QuickBooks, you'd have to actually call the bank up and they've charged something. We don't charge that. Cancel payment is pretty easy. If you want to look at the clear check image after it's cashed, it's attached to the transaction. So what we have is we have the ability for our customers to have an audit trail on who approved the invoice, who approved the payment, 
uh, and you can have as many people as you want approve an invoice, uh, who approve the payment, and then the integration with all the banking systems so that you get the benefit of positive pay and the clear check images. So when three months from now when you're saying, didn't I pay that vendor? You can click and you can see it says pay and you click again and you can see here's the clear check image or here's the payment confirmation and the date it went into their bank account. You know, and so that integration is what makes us unique and it's that type of value that people don't always realize that they're missing beforehand because they have a paper process. But once they get on it, they say, oh my gosh, I would never go back. It's just too valuable to have all that connected together. Wonderful. Uh -huh. uh, I think many of the folks here are in very early stage startup yeah. kind of enterprises. And I think question probably in their minds would be, so, you know, <laughs> what's your revenue model? I mean, you know, for a small company to afford this, you know, whole, uh, you know, platform, manage their receivables and payables, uh, what would they be looking at in, by way of costs? Are they transaction based, per seat based, per month based, or an annual license? How does that work? It's uh, <coughs> all the above right now. Uh, not quite. So we have a subscription model for our customers that once they kind of um, get on board, you get on board for as little as 30 bucks a month. Uh, then the <coughs> next tier would be 50, and the next tier would be 100. Depends on how many users you need. Um, and then we do charge per transaction. When anybody looks at the transactions, it's kind of a non, it's a non-issue, right? I mean, the amount of time and the amount of cost of printing a paper check and connecting with your banking system and getting clear check images and all those things, way more than what we charge. So those fees would be $1.29 for any paper transaction and 49 cents for an electronic transaction. So if you were to try to, if you were to sign up with your bank to do ACH services to your vendors, you'd probably have to pay a couple hundred bucks a month just to have that service. And we're going to say, well, you can get started with us for 25. Uh, if you have more users, then you know you might need the $50 platform. If you have more complicated accounting software, you might need the $100 platform. But um, so the business model is pretty straightforward. It's you know what we're focused on is delivering <coughs> great product and great value and great service. And our customers, I didn't mention this, but one of the most important things about any business is serving your customers and serving them so they're happy. And so we do a net promoter survey every time we interact with a customer and customers give us a score. I think last month's score was over 70. So it's a very high score about people saying that they're going to promote us based on the interactions they have with us. Fantastic. I think that's certainly very affordable for many of the entrepreneurs here and I can see why you need so many customers to yeah, make yeah, your revenue yeah, numbers and yeah. uh, uh, be uh, profitable. So with that, uh, we'll open up to questions. I'm sure many of you have uh, questions that you'd like to ask. How do they know that there's an invoice up there to approve? So we have, um, if the invoice is coming in on the on the payable side, uh, which is the approval brought, right? So the invoice is created by somebody else. Invoice comes in. You, each employee that's involved in approving has an opportunity to set their preferences. So they can get email reminders instantly as soon as it's their turn to approve. Or they can get an email reminder once a week, or they can get it daily. Uh, they can set those preferences. So mostly we drive people back into the website through those email re reminders. I didn't have this stat up there, but um, one of the stats I love about the business is that on average our customers log in twice um, a day, 18% uh, log in more than 100 times a month. So people really are engaging with the product because invoices and, and bills are kind of the backbone of any business. And so. You can set their reminders and how you want them. You get uh, one of the examples. If you have your vendors send those bills straight into Bill.com to that email address I referenced, you can get an email then telling you if there's a bill in Bill.com for you to go look at it. Your account is payable clerk or your office manager can go in and look at it and assign it. And once you pick that vendor relationship, we know who approved that bill the last time and that kicks off the workflow. And if anybody in the workflow wants to have somebody else look at it, they can just add somebody else to it and go from there. On the receivable side, there's, it's less about approving invoices and more about your customer paying you and collaborating with your customer, right? So there is that same type of workflow, but it's more meant, it's more between the company and the customer is what we found customers asking for. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned that you have a 
Uh, thanks, that was a great presentation. Uh, a quick question for you was, uh, um, the, the survey was talking about 83% of the respondents said it is they are happy with the security and stuff like that. Who are this, uh, the respondents for your survey? Uh, we went out to uh, financial professionals, CFOs, controllers, people responsible for managing business just from lists that we had, right? So um, I think many of them, I guess, is probably more than half were already Bill.com customers. Um, but it was just kind of a general list of folks that we had acquired through different marketing webinars and stuff like that. That's impressive. Uh, the follow-up question was: You also cater to the enterprise, large enterprises, or uh, generally SMBs? Uh, so we, you know, our focus is on uh, helping any business uh, of any size. What we have found is that when you get to probably you know 150, 200 million dollars in revenue, the accounting integration might be different than what we do today. So uh, it might be using an SAP and Oracle, and we don't integrate with those folks today. Um, so you know the folks that we, we do have, it really it does depend on your accounting you know, software. So if you use NetSuite or Intact or QuickBooks, and there are public companies, believe it or not, that still use QuickBooks, um, they're using us and they love it, right? So it really depends on your accounting software, and we don't really want to restrict. I think the Fortune 1000, the Fortune 2000 might be companies that we want to serve, but we can serve through a partner. But you know, it's uh, it's a different sales cycle for those companies that I know nothing about. So, yes, sir. I have two questions, unconnected to each other. First one is, who is the custodian for your for the cash? Is it a bank or just you? We uh, it, so we have two different banks that we work with, um, and the it's a trustee account. So each customer's name is identified, um, and. So I guess as a trustee, I mean, we're a co-trustee, so we can have access um, to it and be able to make payments that are out there. Uh, it's not their primary account, right? It's the account that they're using to pay those bills right then, or those payments they're getting in right then. So as soon as it comes in, if we have the funds for maybe two, three nights at most, and then it goes wherever else it needs to go. So it comes through us as uh, we're validating that the funds are real and all that type of stuff. Okay, my second question is, this seems like a horizontal application. Uh, I went to your website, I looked at one of the videos as well, actually two of the videos, and the applications you list, you list several applications, different application areas, but at least there were three or four application areas that I am familiar with that actually do have verticals that, that do the same thing that you're doing just for that particular application space. Wouldn't that be the right way to go if one already knows what business one is in? I'm not sure. So you're saying that the folks that are targeted at a vertical application um, yeah. might be I'll give better. you one example. Uh, property management. Yeah. There's something called propertyware. Yeah. So why wouldn't I go to propertyware? They will provide even more services than you can provide because you're horizontal. You're not, you're not focusing on only property management. Yeah, so we have a number, and I'm not sure if Propertyware is one of them, but we have, we have a very open API, and so a lot of folks are using us to take care of that back office that they don't do. So managing properties is very different than what I would do, um, but managing bills and managing payments is actually pretty universal. That's why. So Propertyware would be your customer, and I would be Propertyware's customer? It, that could be the case, right? So we do have, we have a lot of property management individuals as co or companies as company as customers right because they're using quickbooks and what they want is the ability to invoice all their tenants and the ability to track all the bills by building and so quickbooks does enough for their accounting so they can use us so, so you would go with quickbooks and you rather than some no you could i mean property where there are i can't remember which ones but there are a few in that particular vertical there are a few companies that uh, either have integrated with us or, or are evaluating integrating with us because they want this horizontal ability to process the bills. They don't want to get into workflow on that. They don't want to get into payment collection. To, to Raj's point, the money movement, you asked about regulations. We are regulated. I mean, we have to submit a report you know, all the time about anybody whose name is suspicious because that's OFAC. We have to have compliance around uh, anti-money laundering. We have to have compliance in a number of the states for moving money, it's called NTL. So there's a lot of compliance associated with the business and 
that's you know property where it doesn't want to do that, right? But they might want some of the features we have, so they can use our APIs to customize what features they want. So that's that's the way we see it. So I agree that ultimately it's a better integration vertically, uh, which is probably also how we view the accounting software like QuickBooks and Intact and NetSuite is that you know you can integrate. A, we integrate with them very well, and if they want to integrate with us, it'll probably create more adoption. Not there yet. No, they're not doing it yet. I mean, we, we've done all the integration we can with them. It's up to them to do integration with us now. Yes, sir. Um, so it seems um, <coughs> Bills.com is mainly used by the enterprises. Um, do you plan to support consumers as well? Like, um, it, it's a good question. So um, all of the employees have Bill.com accounts, and all the employees use it at home. Um, it's not our marketing focus. It's not our our business model, um, but it can be valuable. So it really kind of depends. I think, you know, I, I was an early Intuit employee, and so I was always focused on Quicken. And back then in my 20s, you know, tracking every penny was far more important to me than tracking the context of every penny. And so today, I care much more about what do my invoices look like two years from now. Like, I, you know, I mentioned this remodel. Somebody came by the other day. It's like, how much did you pay for that? Because I'd like to go do that in my house. And I could pull it up in Bill.com and I could show them the invoice and send it to them, right? Quicken would have told me how much I paid, but I wouldn't have had the context and would be able to break it out. That's a good question. So someday we may, we may have a product there, but right now it's, we're not targeting those customers. Uh, I have a customer you know, who used the Builder call. Um, you know, I requested them to have a you know um, a direct deposit, but they still send me the paper check. Yeah. At the same time, um, see, suppose I'm in Windows.com, but but my customer is not using it. So how how you know that make it seamless? Like you know, in in that scenario, it looks like you know, all the three parties, my my customers and me and my vendor, you know, both the both all the three parties should be in the in, in your network, right? in right. order to uh, work it like smooth. So in these scenarios, how, what is the difference, what is the value add? There? Yeah, so we, we have, we have definitely have more work to do to make it more seamless for folks to become part of the network. Um, that said, yeah, the folks that are most successful are the ones that say, if you want to get paid faster, give me your bank account, you know, or give me your email address, and you can sign in for bill.com to get paid electronically. I won't take payment from you unless you're willing to pay this way. And so those people do force adoption. We can do more from the user experience to make it simpler and easier to integrate. The value, we have customers that use us internationally where we don't move money. So there's no payment network. And the value they're getting is all around the document management, the approval and the workflow, and the integration with the accounting system. Because they might have you know, 12 different offices around the world and invoices in each of them, and the CFO here still wants to be able to see those invoices and then sync it back with the intact file back to that country, and then that country will print the payment, check it, you know, uh, in that country or however they pay in that country. So I think I, I think there are two parts of the question, right? One was, what's the benefit if you're not in the network? And I think the workflow and the document management and the, the kind of the audit trail of all of that and the integration with the accounting system is very viable. And then for folks that are in Bill.com, how do you make you know, more seamless? That's work we have to do. But just by saying to your vendors and your customers, this is the way I want to pay you, this is the way I want to be paid, makes a big difference. <coughs> if, if you're using us, then we, can, we have templates and emails and we can help you with that. Yeah, so, so you know, I requested specifically a direct deposit. So what, what could be the reason why they said, no, we just want to uh, send you a, a, a paper check and I There's, I there's no reason, so. From that, we don't call Yeah, them. there's no reason. Uh, the customer probably doesn't understand something about what we do because the, 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 there's no difference to them. The money moves from their account on the same day, whether it's a paper check. Yeah, and all it means is that you're getting electronic payments. So there's no difference. So that, that's an example of the type of work. When you, the nice thing about product software product development is you're never done, right? So that's an example where we can make it more obvious uh, that this is no big deal. All they need to do is have your email address. If they put their email address in, they'll just invite. Actually, there's a benefit for them, which means they since they can pay you faster, if your due date is the fifth of the month, they can now schedule that payment on the second, whereas if it's a check, they might have to schedule it on the 31st. 
in order for you to get it by the 5th because it has to go through the postal system and there's a weekend there and all that blah, blah, blah. So but if you stop by later, I'd be happy to see if I can help out and, and, and help you get paid electronically because that's what we want. So, so I have a follow-up question to that because uh, it's a practical problem here. So I can control when I'm writing checks or the way I'm paying, but when I'm receiving, it's, you can't control that. In those cases, when you receive a check, could you, can I just scan it and, and from my side just take care that they are automated or you really need to have the other party signed up? Especially if we have a company, we process about $40,000 average every month right. receiving and sending payments. Right. And in those cases, uh, it's difficult to have everybody aligned. Right, yeah, so you, um, with the receivables product, you can receive a check, you can take a picture of it and store it with the record. Um, we are not, because of some of the regulatory points that Raj you know, brought up, we are not yet doing remote deposit capture because a lot of that has limits on it. And you just gave an example, you might have a check for $20,000. If I can't let a business deposit a $20,000 check, then I don't really have a good product. So we won't build it until we have a bank partner that will allow us to have those types of deposits. Uh, but you can store the check image there so you have a record of the payment and then go down to the bank and deposit it, right? Or mail the deposit. Yeah, so can you work on our side as much as we can and just not worry about how big it is? Yeah, you can. I mean, that's, you know, I, I haven't gone and looked at this, but, you know, on the payable side, for example, I was saying that, you know, 40% of the payments go out electronically. Uh, probably some of the customers are up to 75 or 90 percent are electronic, but there's probably some customers that are zero, right? And they're just—I know this. I think the last time we did look at it, it was like 25 percent of our customer base was not using us for payments at all. They were paying outside of Bill.com, integrating with QuickBooks, and still writing the checks that way. Maybe they wanted the float. Maybe they were worried about us, like you mentioned about who is this company. For whatever reason, they weren't using us, uh, and you know that's too bad because there's a lot of benefits that they could have, but they're still able to get the benefit of the workflow and the document management and integration. And the same is true on the receivable side. There's but, ways to use us. But then another point to that is that you're probably more better known than a small, small company like that. So people may be more <coughs> open to sending you money. Right, and I think that's the that's hopefully the power of the network, right? Is the, as the network gets more and more businesses, entities in it, and people get more comfortable. It's actually one of the reasons I did buy the URL bill.com. It's because it's generic enough that you can put a brand behind it. And over time, people will say, oh, okay, it's bill.com, I trust that because they have half a million, they have a million businesses in the network and you know they're gonna have the controls and procedures around this that a small company can't have, right? You're not gonna have all the money regulatory requirements that we have to worry about. I have a good question. I know you mentioned that your customers vary from small to big, and you, we all kind of startups here. How how big a new venture has to be for you for you to say that it makes sense to get on Bill.com or some other services? How many employees, or is it how many bills you pay, and revenue is going to be far like a year or two years down the line? Yeah, I think the the revenue number is not the indicator. I think the the primary indicator of whether we're a good fit is kind of the complexity of the business. So. If you're paying less than five bills a month, probably not something that, there are customers that do that with us because they value the context of all their documents and all their paper and the audit trail in one place. But for most businesses, if you don't think you're gonna grow, if you're always gonna be five bills a month, you probably don't value that as much. No, not always, you're in the growing state. Right. When do you get on it? Yeah, so I, we would typically tell customers if you have north of 10 bills a month, um, that's a really good time to kind of, you know, look at us. Though we do have, you know, like I said, a lot of customers are just using us for three to five bills a month. Um, you know, it might be 10, 15 percent of our base is just using us for a small amount. But when we see, if we look at the net promoter scores and all that type of stuff, there's increasing uh, value and benefit drawn from more complexity. So north of 10 is when it seems to get more interesting. I was wondering what was your uh, strategy to build a customer base at the beginning because it looks like you know right now you have a network but there was some trust issue at the, at the beginning so I was wondering. It's 
a good question. Um, one, and it's one of the great things about this group. The, the most important thing I learned, which I did not know was true when I left into it to start PayCycle, is that the network is the most important thing about making any business successful. And so that's why folks are here. You, don't, you may not be starting today. You may not know how somebody can help you. But that network helps. So the first 15 or 20 customers were people that I knew. And I would just talk to them about what I was doing. and say, that sounds interesting. I like you, so I'll try it. And then they got the benefit. And then you kind of work out of that. But ultimately, we have three different channels that we market to. So we have a direct channel, which is Google AdWords. If you're looking for accounts payable automation or accounts receivable automation, those keywords will drive you to bill.com. We do display ads. We do uh, webinars and other types of marketing. Then we have accounts, and accounts are great, and that's, I think I mentioned to show because that's one of the things he does. And accounts are great because they're the gift that keep on giving for us, right? Because we, like once Ashok started using us, he's now using us for more than one client. I think he's up to half a dozen clients. And so our average account, I think, has about half a dozen. We have some accounts that have over 220, 25 clients, I think. And so that partnership, uh, we started that market in partnership with the AICPA. So we have direct with the SPA, and we're just now getting into banks. Uh, I think that part of the question about you know do a consumer online bill payment, banks are an obvious place to actually offer these types of services. And the integration we can do with them to really democratize all the cash man management treasury services they offer now to the business is pretty powerful. So they don't they don't know how to serve small and medium businesses uh, with these types of tools, and yet we can solve that. So. I guess the thing is, you know, network, use your friends and, and uh, ask them and leverage that and then you, know, you have to have some channel strategy and so direct accountants and banks are what we use. Thank you. So I, I guess I'm a little confused on, um, you, you spoke about context to your bills. Right. So the, the supporting documentation that comes along with bills, is that uploaded to bills.com? How is that handled? Yeah, so you can, you can load anything into bill.com, right? So we let you upload PDFs, Word files, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, JPEGs, images, you know, anything that you think is part of the context of the bill. And the way we do that is we give you your own email address and your own fax number. And I think over, I think it's close to two thirds of the documents come in via fax. People still find that easier than scanning or taking a picture. And it is actually pretty easy, right? You, you program a speed dial with say bill.com fax number, you drop it in, you can drop 20 sheets in, you push a button, 20 bills just go into bill.com. I see, so um, as far as your, your clients and, and your customers, uh, do, do you face some challenges in getting them to trust, uh, kind of putting contracts and stuff like that on bill.com and, and fe feeling really secure? And how they use that? You know, there there might be, but we haven't seen it, right? And this could be, you know, we're I don't know where we are um, on the cross and the chasm, you know, analogy. Maybe it's still the early adopters. I, I was on a panel with Jeffrey Moore um, back in December, and, and he asked everybody on the panel, "Where were you on the cross and the chasm?" And everybody's like, "Oh, we crossed the chasm." It was it was a digital CPA conference, and and we had the most customers of all of them. And I said, "We haven't crossed the chasm." So I, th I think early adopters don't ask those questions. They kind of look, what's the pedigree of the management team and say, you know what, this is like smart guys, I would want them to trust me, so I'm gonna trust them. So we haven't noticed that trust issue. I think as we cross that chasm, more people will ask, but the good news is then we'll have half a million or a million businesses, or maybe it'll be offered to you by a bank that you see on the corner or whatever, right? So that's gonna help those trust issues when you see that partnership. That was part of the reason for the partnership with the ICPA for accounts is making sure that they know that we have that type of ability and confidence, you know, from the somebody they respect. Well, okay. yes. Last question. I, if I'm a customer, if I'm your customer, do, do all my customers have to be your customer? No. Then how do they interact with me through Bill.com? So both your so your all of, let's let's do payables first. So all of the vendors, if you have an email address for those vendors. Whenever you approve a payment, schedule a payment, they'll get an email saying you've scheduled a payment and the payment's being mailed, or if it's an electronic payment, the payment will be in their bank account on this date. 
right? So that's how they interact, and that's the beginning point. There's a lot more that we can do so that then your vendors could submit those invoices electronically to you, right? Right from their QuickBooks file. It's something that was on our roadmap. We haven't done it yet, but that would be an example of what we could do for them. On the receivables, um, you, you know, our customers will put all their customers in bill.com. Those customers then will get emailed the bills that they have, or those, yeah, those customers get emailed the bills they have. And then some of them choose to pay on bill.com, some choose to send a check in. So it's really up to your customer. You can incent them, you can, you know, say this is the only way I want to be paid, it, you know, but that's kind of up to you. And I think, you know, uh, there are some customers, I think of one that is a, it's a franchise business that's it's called the it's money mailers. Like when you get home, you get that value pack of all the coupons that you probably you know, maybe sift through, but most of it probably doesn't trash. That guy has you know a couple thousand vendors that he works or customers he works with, and they all pay him electronically. He said this is the way I want to get paid, and he just kind of mandated. It took him maybe six months to get all of his customers to pay him that way, but it's now all through the electronic. Oh, we do that. We have relationships with banks, and banks are all over the place. So no matter where in the country they are. They can go to one of the branches if they want to, or they can hook up their own bank, or their own account with that. They can do that with this account. That's it. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, they, they do hook up their bank account, and they can do it from their phone, and they can pay the bill from the phone. They don't have to go anywhere. So they can hook up their bank account to bills.com? At bill.com. Yeah, they can do that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And they can pay via credit card. I guess it's easier because you are asking them no, some of my customers will not do that at all. They will right. actually drive into a bank branch. We have relationship with bank branches, so they can do that too. Right. And some of them want to sit at home and click on a mouse button. Right. So I'm wondering how they would interact they, with Yeah, I'd have to understand more about your business, but we give you the receivables customers get a portal where your customers log in, they can pay via credit card or ACH and they can still send you a paper payment or go to the bank and pay it whichever way they pay you. So we don't mandate it, say they can pay any way you want, but you know, our customers say they get paid pay faster when it's through the bill.com portal because it's so easy. We don't do, unfortunately this is part of 9-11, the money movement internationally is very difficult. So it's on our roadmap, but we don't do it today. There's a number of things we have to do that make that happen. Great, with that, Renee, yeah, this you, is very insightful. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs>